Here we are, we're coming up the fence to fence. <laughs> but he's going to be out of here soon. Oh, is it? Hopefully they're up to our other. How's it going, man? Hey, Looking man. good. Hey. Oh, We're talk about a full up. house. Hopefully, you record the talk. Thank you. So, today it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Trent Lukacic, uh, who came to us from the mechanical engineering department at Cornell in 2010 and has been a PhD student in the aerospace uh, lab, uh, aerospace design lab ever since. So Trenton is uh, going to be defending a thesis on the topic of sewer modeling and active subspaces for efficient optimization of superficial aircraft. But he has been doing a large number of things. He's quite multifaceted, I would say. So he likes the word swab. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, his personality, but he <laughs> not in one swab project, but in two swab projects. First one is a, a conceptual design environment that he won't be talking about today. But the second one is he's one of the founding members of the UAB club that I see many members on present here. So um, in addition, he's been liking to build and fly quadcopters. He's been up to American Samoa uh, doing imaging of coral reefs. And you won't hear about any of those things here today. <laughs> You'll be hearing more about some specific mathematical techniques to reduce dimensionality and enhance the capability to do design. I have to say, in a lighter note, uh, his girlfriend Tamaki is here, and I think there must be a little competitive spirit. Uh, she's defending her thesis on Friday, but uh, Trent is beating her to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, the committee, um, which is composed of Professor uh, Stefano Ramon from Computer Science, who is the chair of the Defense Committee. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Paul Constantine from the Applied Mathematics and Statistics Department at the Colorado School of Mines, who has traveled here for the defense. Professor Lan Crow uh, on the right, uh, uh, I guess it's now official, is returning to our department starting this summer. And Professor Michael Kochenberger, also of the Aeronautics and Astronautics Department. So we're looking forward to your presentation, Trent. Uh, carry it away. Thank you so much, Juan, and thank you so much to the committee for coming here today and everybody else uh, as well. I'm really excited today to tell you about the work I've done over the last few years on surrogate modeling and active subspaces for efficient optimization of supersonic vehicles. Many of us are probably familiar with the Concorde. It was a passenger jet that flew between 1974 and 2003. It was capable of carrying between 90 and, 100 and 120 passengers anywhere from London to New York or even London to the Caribbean. All of this was at twice the speed of sound. Despite this awesome speed, two attributes contributed to its eventual retirement. First, it was rather fuel inefficient. If you considered how many passengers it carried, it got about 14 miles to the gallon. Compared to a Boeing 737 today, uh, it gets about 50 miles to the gallon. But perhaps more importantly, it was really loud. Even though it, <coughs> even though it flew at 50,000 feet up in the air, when it was flying above the speed of the sound, the shock waves that came down from it when it reached the ground was as loud as listening to a jackhammer that was three feet away. Fast forward to today, NASA's leading the development and design of the next generation supersonic passenger jet through the N plus two supersonics program. Several institutions are participating in this program. I've been fortunate enough to be part of the, uh, the team that's with, uh, part of Lockheed, uh, General Electric, Electric, and Stanford that's been designing uh, the concept that you see here. It has capabilities that are very similar to the Concorde, but most importantly, it's, it will be much, much less quiet, much, much more quiet. <laughs> uh, uh, ADPLDB, or perceived loudness in decibels, is about as loud as this room would get during the grad student happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> to make a supersonic passenger jet this quiet, every single shape and every single curve needs to be finely tuned. And to do this, we rely on computer simulations that can automatically improve the performance iteratively by changing the shape. This is the purpose of optimal shape design. Now, this airplane has a span of about 30 meters from tip to tip of the wing. Imagine defining shape parameters every 10, uh, with 10 or 15 spanwise stations, each with a twist uh, and several uh, thickness and camber parameters. We can easily reach about 100 design variables without even breaking a sweat. And this is a problem because in 100 variables and 100 dimensions, there are a lot of designs to consider. 
We call this the curse of dimensionality. The optimizers that we use today manage this curse in various ways. Local optimizers are actually able to manage problems in large dimension quite well, provided that they have access to efficient gradients. However, they're only able to investigate local minima and may miss a deeper minima on the other side of a well, uh, on the other side of a hill. Global optimizers are actually able to find these deeper minima, but they require a large number of function evaluations and usually blow out the computational budget. Surrogate-based optimization uh, tries to strike a balance between these two by constructing an inexpensive approximation of the objective uh, with a reasonable number of function evaluations. However, these approximations tend not to be predictive in high dimension. A good rule of thumb is about no more than 10 dimensions. The solution I will present today works around this by exploiting redundant variables to find a low dimension subspace that captures the global trends of the objective function. Here's a quick example. This rotated parabola embedded in two dimensions has all of its variation described in one direction, indicated by the green arrow, and no variation in the other direction, indicated by the red arrow. If we're able to uh, parameterize a basis in which we just uh, describe all of the variation along the green arrow, we can describe this function in one dimension. This can work in one, two, fifty, a hundred dimensions, as long as there are correlated global trends. We're able to apply this idea to the aircraft design problem if we make a fundamental assumption that for the types of objectives that we're typically interested in, and for the types of geometric parameterizations we tend to construct, there exist redundant or correlated design variables that can be described in a low dimension subspace. Exploiting this assumption to construct surrogate models that accelerate preliminary design processes is the purpose of my thesis. To that effect, these are the contributions that I've made for my graduate work. Uh, first, I've developed a methodology for surrogate modeling with inaccurate gradients to use uh, using a new configuration of noise hyperparameters within Gaussian process regression, otherwise known as GPR. Second, I developed an algorithm for efficient optimization using GPR in low dimension composed of two phases, a global uh, refinement and a local refinement of the surrogate. Third, I discovered and characterized active subspaces, or these reduced dimensionality subspaces of, uh, of our supersonic design problems, include and also explored their connections to fundamental aerodynamics. Fourth, I developed an algorithm for efficient optimization in high dimension uh, that's built in these reduced dimension subspaces. Finally, much of the work has been published to open source uh, through packages in Python. Today I'll focus on the three contributions highlighted in bold, and to that effect, uh, I will break down the, top, the, the talk into the following sections. First, I'll review some concepts from supersonics that are relevant to the talk, especially the use of an equivalent area formulation for designing quiet sonic boom. Second, I'll talk about surrogate modeling, and within which I developed a new methodology, uh, as I mentioned, that can model accurate surrogate models using inaccurate gradients. Then I'll present the work in which I discovered active subspaces for uh, aerodynamic design problems and present the results that relied on a new strategy for optimization using these active subspaces. Let's jump into supersonic design. As the airplane flies through the air, it sheds shock waves that propagate to the ground. As they do this, they stretch and they coalesce until they generate this typical N wave, sonic, uh, known for the sonic boom noise. A significant amount of work was done between 1960 and 1975 that allowed us to predict pressure signatures in the near field given an equivalent body of revolution defined by its distribution of cross-sectional area. Additional work by McLean and Thomas enabled us the ability to find equivalent area distributions that resulted in favorable ground signatures. In the last 10 years, several works have applied modern approaches to boom propagation, the boom propagation problem and have used surrogate-based optimization over CFD simulations to find aircraft that match a target equivalent area known to have a favorable boom noise. A significant amount of work has gone into mission-level analysis of supersonic vehicles, and most recently, the N plus two supersonics program has used and extended these approaches to create an exciting new set of designs that have even been validated in wind tunnel. My work will primarily operate in the near field, simulating high-fidelity simulations with CFD and constraining the sonic boom by targeting a known favorable equivalent area distribution. A key contribution will be to extend the work that was performed with, with surrogate-based optimization with 10 to 30 dimensions and enable problems that use between 100 and 200 dimensions. To, constri to constrain the equivalent area, I'll use a functional delta uh, AE shown here based on the L2 norm of the difference between a target equivalent area distribution and a current design equivalent area distribution. 
All the simulation work that I present today will be done using an open source solver called SU2. SU2 is special because not only can it provide a direct solution, which, which estimates our lift and drag and equivalent area objective functions, but it also can provide a continuous adjoint solution, which effectively gives us uh, infinite dimensional gradients under the continuous adjoint formulation. To make shape changes, we use a freeform deformation, control, uh, freeform deformation uh, strategy, also known as a cage-based method, where we basically put a box around the wing and smoothly deform the wing by dragging around control points. Now that you know a few concepts from supersonics, especially the use of an equivalent area formulation for designing quiet sonic booms, I'll now tell you about the work I've done towards surrogate modeling and how we can actually use inaccurate gradients to form accurate surrogate models. Gaussian process regression is the surrogate modeling technique that I use in my thesis. I'll highlight four particular strengths and four particular challenges that come with Gaussian process regression. First, in terms of strengths, it's a non-parametric model, which means that it makes very few assumptions about the fit and can model very general behaviors. Second, being a probabilistic model, it's able to provide not only a prediction of the function, but also an estimate of the uncertainty of the prediction at, that, at a particular location. This contributes to the third strength in which these models can be used to construct sampling criteria that combine both the prediction and the uncertainty to efficiently refine and, uh, the accuracy of the surrogate model. Finally, these models are flexible enough to include additional pieces of information, such as gradients, to improve the accuracy or the efficiency of surrogate models. In terms of challenges, Gaussian process regression has a small set of parameters called hyperparameters that need to be tuned. Typically, these are chosen via an inner optimization problem, which can become very expensive in large dimension or uh, can become, uh, or with large amounts of data. Furthermore, Gaussian process regression can become numerically unstable in the presence of uh, uh, inconsistent or nearly co-located data. And finally, as I mentioned several times now, Gaussian process regression struggles in high dimensionality. There's been no shortage of work done around these challenges and, and uh, strengths. I'm going to highlight a couple of them that are very important for this part of the talk. Gaussian process regression, as I use it, is similar to Kriegen, which was first developed by Mathurin, uh, in uh, way back in 1963. As, as written by Rasmussen, however, GPR is built within the context of machine learning and his book published in 2006 provides a liberating notation which, in my opinion, provides an extra amount of creativity when constructing new models. In terms of using gradient information, Chung in 2002 was one of the first to apply gradients from aerospace design problems to improve the accuracy of surrogate models. Fixes for numerical stability have been proposed by Booker, who builds layers of Gaussian process regression or Kriegen fits, or, and also by Raj Narayan, who discovered a way to uh, find co-located points and omit them from the fit. I will propose a fix that manipulates the hyperparameters to allow decorrelation between functions and gradients, which will admit the parallel benefit that makes the problem more numerically stable. I'd like to explain how this contribution works, and to do so, I'll have to dig into the math. Deep inside Gaussian process regression, we make an assumption about the relationship between functions, only based on their locations in the design space, here noted as XP, Next Q. A typical model for that, that people use in Gaussian process regression is the squared exponential model, which I show here. You'll no, notice that there's two parameters left over, theta 1 and theta, theta 2. Theta 1 is the nominal variance of the problem, about how much uh, behavior you might expect to see in the function as you move around in the design space. Theta 2 is the length scale, and it describes about how close you need to be to between two function evaluations two function values in order to see an effect. This kernel is used in a system of linear equations that estimates an unknown function g star at locations x star, given known function values g at locations x. Gaussian process regression can become even more accurate or more efficient if we add additional information in the forms of gradients. And to do that, we simply take the derivative of the kernel function. In uh, combining all the different pairs of the samples that we have in our function, these, these functions here actually generate a covariance matrix. And this is what we use to form uh, the basis of this linear system of equations. Uh, in making this taking the derivative of the kernel, we actually make a very strong assumption about the correlation between an objective and a gradient, and that specifically that there is an exact correlation. This means that, that there are inaccurate gradients, the 
accuracy of the fit will suffer. Usually in Gaussian process regression, we model error with noise, and specifically an independently distributed Gaussian noise, shown here as epsilon. But when we take the gradient of this kernel, we lose the stationary term, this noise term. So in order to manage gradient inaccuracies in my work, I had to step outside of this function gradient correlation to see that we can append an extra noise parameter to the gradient terms of the covariance matrix. At the time, this was a non-obvious approach based on literature, but it ends up working quite well. The end result is that we get two separate hyperparameters. One noise parameter, theta 3, just for the objective function, and one noise parameter, theta 4, for the gradients. In total, we have four hyperparameters in my formulation, and they need to be tuned in the learning problem. A typical approach which I adopt in my work is maximizing marginal likelihood. It has multiple local minima uh, for real data, or for realistic airspace data, so I use a global optimizer to run this problem. In software, the solution of this learning problem is actually quite tricky, and to encourage physically representative fits, I needed to construct a set of constraints on the hyperparameters. I want to highlight this last one, which says that we want to constrain the hyperparameter for the noise and the objectives to be less than that for the hyperparameter of the noise and the gradients. Basically, this means that we want to trust the objective before we trust the gradients. What can happen without this constraint is that the gradient information can overpower the objective. After all, there's one component of gradient for every dimension, whereas there's only one objective. Now that you have an idea of how I formulate Gaussian process regression to manage gradient inaccuracies, I'll show you a quick example that represents how this method performs. In this test case, I use a NACA 012 airfoil. It's actually a transonic case, but it's a, a nice exercise of the method. Shown here are contours of density on the left, which provide an estimate of drag or lift. And on the right, contours of drag adjoint density, which provide our gradients or sensitivities of drag to changes in the airfoil. Adjuncts are extraordinarily efficient, but they're known to have inaccuracies. This is because the continuous adjoints, as we use here, are formulated to simulate the sensitivity of the real and physical flow, not the sensitivity of the numerical flow, which we're running over here. This creates a decorrelation between the objective and the gradient. I parameterize the airfoil in this example using bump functions, two of them, one on the top and one on the bottom. The magnitudes of the bumps vary in fraction of the core length and are controlled by two variables. This is a simple example in two dimensions to be able to visually show uh, the effects and the strategy. This pr procedure, however, generalizes to additional dimensions. This is how the drag varies for changes in parameters x1 and x2. I'm showing here on the left, on the z-axis, the drag coefficient as a function of the two input variables. And on the right, I'm showing simply a contour plot of constant drag as another perspective of this, of this behavior. This data was collected with a 10 by 10 grid of samples, and that's a really inefficient way to, in to interrogate the function. Using Gaussian, pro Gaussian process regression, the idea is that we can collect random samples of objectives and gradients on this, this function to form an equally representative approximation of the surface. However, when we do this without accounting for gradient inaccuracies, we get a very corrupted surface. Here plotted in the white, white surface, and on the right, red contours. Notice that a local minima has appeared in this surrogate, and this would cause uh, some very misleading behaviors within, the op within an optimizer. This surrogate model has 5% root mean squared error compared to the baseline surface. <coughs> Using my methodology, it's possible to utilize the inaccurate gradients to build a reasonable approximation of the surface. Notice how the trends are now being respected, and there's only one global minimum now. There's also now only 1% root mean squared error between the two surfaces. With this surrogate modeling tool in hand that can effectively use gradients, I continued on to develop a surrogate-based optimization technique, uh, which I was able to demonstrate could accelerate the optimization of a realistic supersonic aircraft. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to dig into this today, but the executive summary is that I was able to find results similar to the gradient-based optimization shown here in the trace of blue, using a surrogate-based strategy shown here in, this, in uh, a trace of red, but with fewer function evaluations. Despite these developments, and being able to use gradient, uh, gradients to inform the surrogate model, I still was not able to breach the curse of dimensionality. I was stuck in 10 dimensions for my model, and so I needed a new strategy, a, a new set of tools. This is where active subspaces came in, and it's the next part of my talk. 
In this part, I'll show you how I found and used reduced dimension active subspaces for, circuit, for supersonic design problems, in effect, breaching the crystal dim dimensionality within surrogate based optimization. The goal of this part of the talk is to reduce dimensionality of a function f that is a function of a uh, set of uh, a vector quantity x. Here I'm showing you an example that's basically a paraboloid function of two variables. Low values are plotted in pink and large values are plotted in yellow. There's a clear trend to the upper right of the plot and we want to be able to find this in algorithm. We treat the function f as a black box, so we can only interact with it by sampling. Shown here are a well-spread random sample. At each one of these dots, we take a function value of f. There exist methods that can identify important subsets of variables, including analysis of variation, main effect screening, and elementary effect screening. If we were to apply it to this data, we would identify that the first variable, x1, is a little bit more important than the second variable, x2. And so we would omit the unimportant variable and model the entire behavior of the function with only one input, x1, essentially along this direction. This is a little unfortunate because we've left a little bit of behavior on the table. If we were able to point this arrow up towards the top right, we, would, we could have described more of the behavior of the function if we had been able to use linear combinations of the inputs. Principal component analysis is a well-known tool that's able to find important linear combinations except it's only used to find correlated sets of outputs. In this case, we're looking to reduce the dimension of inputs. So what we have to do is recognize that the gradients point in the directions of greatest, intra, uh, sorry, of greatest change, and we can use this to inform our dimensionality reduction. In this case, we see that the gradients point along about the same direction, and if we run principal component analysis on these samples, we're able to identify this direction. This is essentially active subspaces, applying principal component analysis to the gradients. The approach was first pro proposed by a fellow Trent, last name Rusi, in his thesis in 2010, and Constantine and Wong formalized the approach since and have been promoting its use in modeling complex systems. Once we identify this direction, we're able to project the data down into this active variable, and we can find that we can describe most of the global behavior of the objective function in this one, one variable. With this background of active subspaces uh, and how it works in concept, I'd also like to show how it works in algorithm. As I mentioned, we collect a sample of gradients, shown here as grad f, and use them to estimate their covariance function, c. These gradients are, are sampled according to some uh, sampling strategy. In this case, I use a, uh, a Latin hypercube sampling with a, with a, um, a constant density function. Decomposing the covariance matrix allows us to identify important, uh, allows us to decompose it into eigenvectors, uh, which identify important directions in the design space, as well as eigenvalues, which identify, compared to the other directions, how, how important they are. In recognizing that small eigenvalues indicate uh, that the corresponding eigenvector is approximately in the null space of this matrix, we can partition the eigenvector matrix into an active space U and an inactive space V. We discard the inactive space V and retain the columns of U to form the basis of our active subspace. We can now project designs down into the active subspace using this forward map, a simple linear combination of the inputs. From a high level, this algorithm is very simple, and indeed it programs up in MATLAB and Python in about 10 lines of code. But the big question is left over, and that is how many dimensions or how many directions do you retain? To answer this question, you have to collect a few pieces of information and using the work recently published by Constantine. First, the first piece of information is that eigenvalues uh, under this construction are related to the average norm of the gradient. The sum of the eigenvalues for a particular basis thus describes how sensitive the function is to changes in that basis. If the sum of the eigenvalues are small, that means that the function is almost flat in that direction. If the eigenvalues are large, that means we're going to want to consider the behavior in, those, in that basis. The other piece of information we need to know is uh, how well we've estimated the directions of these eigenvectors. If they're pointing in the wrong direction, that means that we're looking, about, uh, we're looking at the valley from about the wrong angle. It's possible to estimate this error using an approach called bootstrap, which works by resampling the gradients uh, with replacement. Just imagine taking our original gradient sample set and recombining them to, to create a whole new sample set. 
and look at how much your eigenvectors change as a result of these resamplings. The other piece, uh, sorry, so combining all of these pieces of information together, we can uh, form a heuristic that's able to approximately bound the error we expect to see for a surrogate model in a particular active subspace. The information that contributes to this are as follows. First, we have this term here, which is the sum of the eigenvalues for the inactive space. We want these terms to be small. The other term here is the sum of the eigenvalues for the active space, weighted by the error that we have when estimating the particular basis for the number of directions we've retained. We actually want the sum of this term to be very large. It means that we have a lot of behavior in our basis. But if we estimate the direction well, this term will be small, and so the rest of this term goes to zero. This heuristic provides uh, an important measure that we can use to inform a decision for how many active subspace directions to retain. Now that we're equipped with this whole new analysis method for reducing dimensionality in aerodynamic design, I exercise this method on three different classes of problems. First, a canonical 2D geometry, then a simplified three-dimensional geometry, and finally, a fully complex three-dimensional passenger deck. I'll show you first the canonical problem, a biparabolic airfoil. The biparabolic airfoil is a classic two-dimensional shape. It's used extensively within supersonic analysis. Here I simulated it with an Euler CFD simulation with a well-refined grid and well-converged uh, simulations. I parameterized the shape with 20 design variables spread across, uh, spread across the airfoil with using preformed deformation boxes. If we look at the raw samples from collecting 900 randomly sampled designs within the design space, we get uh, this, this behavior. <laughs> I essentially just have, have stacked lift up against design index to see that wow, we have we have all this noise in our uh, in our function if we if we vary our airfoil. We want to be able to pull useful trends from all of this data by looking how the shape changes um, in the design space. In order to do that, we look at these two uh, sets of spectrum. Here I'm showing on in the left plot values of the uh, the eigenvalues as they vary with increasing dimension of active subspace. On the right, I'm plotting the heuristic again with increasing dimension. One of the things that we like to look for in these types of plots are gaps in the eigenvalues. They tend to correlate with low values in the heuristic and indicate that we've uh, accurately modeled this particular active subspace. Uh, we can also look at higher, higher uh, order gaps, which tend, in this case, to correspond to the next tier of, of lower values in the heuristic. We use the heuristic not really to tell us how many dimensions to retain, but rather how many dimensions to not retain. And in one interpretation of this plot, it could be said that we would want to retain either one, two, three, or four directions. We would not want to retain five or six eigenvectors or directions. Or we could start considering retaining seven, eight, or nine directions. Because the eigenvalue gap is so large here for the first direction, we're going to look at projection of all this data down into the first eigenvector. If we do that, we get the data, we get a nicely correlated plot that looks like this. Here I'm plotting the lift coefficient on the y-axis as it varies with movement in this active subspace. Think of all these all the, the all, all of these designs in 20 dimensions projected in a linear combination into one variable. The other way to think of this visually is that there are 20 dimensions going into and out of the screen. This nicely this data nicely collapsed into a manifold, and uh, while there's still a significant amount of uh, variation left over, you can still imagine drawing a line through this fit. This is the first exciting result, that for a complex system of partial differential equations parameterized by 20 variables, we're able to collapse all of this data and all of this behavior down into one dimension. There's more to find here, though. Reaching back into classical supersonic thin airfoil theory, it's a well-known result that lift for a constant uh, Mach number is a simple linear function on angle of attack. If we take as an assumption, or perhaps a leap of faith, that the active variable is, is the angle of attack, we find that the two models line up quite well. This is another exciting result. It means that not only are we getting a dimensionality reduction, but we're also able to get results that are coherent with first order aerodynamics. Simply put, the computer has been able to learn that angle of attack is important. 
We can look one layer deeper to see how these shapes change according to the to movements in the active subspace. With the geometry parameterization, uh, I can deform the shape according to stretching the eigenvector along, uh, according to displacements in the active variable I showed here. So the baseline design co corresponds to an active variable of zero, indicated by the line. And if we move ourselves up in the active subspace towards the higher components of lift, we find that the eigenvector tells us that in order to increase lift most rapidly, we want to raise the, the, la the leading edge and lower the trailing edge of the airfoil. If you take, uh, while this is not a rigid rotation, as we would maybe think of angle of attack, if you take the standard definition for angle of attack by drawing the line between the trailing and the leading edge, you can indeed see that this is an angle of attack mode. So now you can see that active subspace is not only find dimensionality reduction, but these results are also correlating to principal aerodynamics and have physically intuitive deformation modes that, for example, could be used to help a designer make decisions in a preliminary design process. In the course of this dissertation, I discovered similar connections for drag and, I and equivalent area, but unfortunately I don't have enough time to show them today. It's possible to build a surrogate model in these active subspaces, and we want to make sure we understand how well these model the data. So to do that, I ran an exploratory experiment in which I fit surrogate models to increasing sizes of active subspaces shown here on the x-axis. I'm plotting here either an et uh, various estimates of the error. Uh, the surrogate model was fit with the original 900 samples used to construct the, act construct the active subspace. Active subspace. And I also ran an additional 3,800 samples to construct a test set. The test, testing error constructed or evaluated in a root mean squared sense is plotted here according to the green traces for drag and for equivalent area. Also plotted on top of this is the heuristic that I mentioned earlier, plotted in purple. The experiment shows that the heuristic can track the training and testing error trends, which makes it useful for informing the number of dimensions to keep without having to run this large 5,000 sample experiment. This is important because being able to reliably, reliably build surrogate models in these active subspaces will be critical to making them useful for surrogate-based optimization. The biparabolic airflow, as I've shown it now, demonstrates not quite nicely that there's presence of active subspaces in aerospace designs, but it's a Mickey Mouse problem. Let's take a look at some three-dimensional geometry. Here, the Langley business jet and the supersonic passenger jet from the M plus 2 program. This is a simplified model of the Langley supersonic pas uh, business, business jet. It's a design that's based on a significant amount of effort that came out of NASA and academ academia and included studies of mesh refinement requirements and a comparison to wind tunnel tests. Only the fuselage and the main wing are modeled to keep things simple. I collected 150 samples, each with a direct and three adjoint solutions to provide gradients. And each sample of all of these solutions took about 100 minutes on 54 cores. I parameterized the geometry with one freeform deformation box. This creates a large dimension parameterization, 198 variables. It's rather unusual parameterization, parameterization as well because typically we look at components uh, of the aircraft, like the wing and the fuselage, individually in an effort to reduce the number of parameters. Uh, as before, I collected gradient samples and ran the active subspace analysis. Shown here is the first active subspace mode for lift. Before, I was showing you static plots of the deformation. Here, I animate the motion through the active subspace indicated by the vertical line. These deformations are exaggerated by 10 times, and they're colored by displacement in the z direction. This is a three-dimensional geometry with Euler's, Euler simulations and 198 design variables, and still, we're able to use a simple linear combination of these inputs to describe much of the behavior in lift. And we can see that the geometry changes uh, shown in these plots uh, are needed to induce this behavior. Let me freeze the animation at the maximum lift co uh, condition. For example, see that the fuselage here is cambering and in the process is twisting the wing to expose a higher incidence angle to oncoming flow and also cambering the wing as well. These are changes in concept that make sense, but uh, the active subspace analysis can find the important combinations automatically. On their own, these shape modes can be used by a designer as a parameterization for its own preliminary design study. And this is only one of many modes. There are anywhere between four and 10 physically interesting modes, each for lift, drag, and equivalent area. Some of them that I'm plotting here. 
Uh, one, one of interest I'd like to highlight is the third mode for equivalent area, which shows that we want to thicken the fuselage and give wash in to the, to the wing in order to increase the equivalent area uh, functional. This means that by thickening the airfoil, or sorry, thickening the fuselage and changing the twist uh, to increase the incidence on the wing, we change the equivalent area distribution, which increases our equivalent area functional, which was constructed as an L2 norm on a, on a target. Um, the most complex geometry I studied in my thesis was the N plus two supersonic passenger jet. In terms of simulated features, this one is extensive. It has finely shaped wings, tails, and the engines are modeling intake and exhaust. I collected 310 samples of direct and three adjoint solutions, uh, and each evaluation took on the order of 120 minutes. Unlike the Langley business jet, or passenger business jet, I had to parameterize this shape with components. I put freeform deformation boxes, four of them, ac across various parts of the air. Uh, of the airplane, one on the fuselage, one on the main wing, the tail, and what people call the aft deck. In total, there were, there were 105 variables. <coughs> Despite being partitioned, I still found that there's an active subspace for lift. In this case, the deformation mode shows a twisting of the main wing and of the tail. And again, the, the behavior in the lift, uh, the li lift objective is approximately linear. At this point, we have to stop and recognize the overall trends across these three problems. The biparabolic airfoil, the Langley business jet, and the N plus two supersonic passenger jet all admit first active subspaces for lift that approximately have a linear dependence on the incidence of a lifting surface. The coherence of this result is one of the important conclusions of my dissertation that verified the usefulness of active subspaces in aerospace design. Again, these results can be found in other objectives at higher order modes. Which I'm showing here. Okay, so at this point, I've shown you how we can build surrogate models based on inaccurate gradients using new configure a new configuration of the noise hyperparameters, and I've shown you that you can use gradients of aerodynamic shapes to reduce the dimensionality of inputs and find physically intuitive behaviors. I'll now show you the last piece of work that I did to connect active subspaces and surrogate-based optimization in the context of optimal shape. Connecting these pieces required me to take a close look at the relationships between the full space and the active subspace. I've, I've shown here uh, that, I've shown you earlier that we can easily go from the full space to the active subspace through a forward map, which is just a linear combination of inputs. The inverse map is much more difficult because there's many points x for each point y in the active subspace. In the end, we need to be able to find one point from the full space because we have to send one and only one point to our CFD solver to reevaluate the design. A simple inverse map can take the pseudo inverse of the basis matrix, anchoring the map on a central point x0, which for example could be a baseline design. The key drawback is that uh, the full space point that comes out of this map may not be bounded in, in the full space. We typically design global design bounds on our problem for optimization, and we need to be able to respect these. So an, import, an improvement on this map is to write a small inner optimization problem that expresses this map with constraints. Here, we have chosen a point in the active space Y and are looking to find a point in the full space X. We want to enforce these, cons these requirements as constraints. Here, the bounding uh, global design bounds that we describe in the be beginning of our problem, as well as the forward map here, shown as a linear combination constraint. Uh, any variation that's left over in the full space, I regularize out on the norm of the design on the design vector. This problem is this optimization problem is convex and it's easily solvable with a quadratic program with trivial computational costs. I've taken this one step further to incorporate the need for multiple active subspaces. As I've shown you earlier, there's often different active subspace modes for different objectives. We want to allow these differences in the uh, we want to allow these diff differences so the optimizer can make trade-offs between the two objectives. An algorithm to add one additional subspace requires us to add one additional active subspace set of variables, as well as its forward map. Still, this problem is convex and it's trivially solvable again with a quadratic program. It's possible to embed, embed this inverse map as a scalar consistency constraint, useful for no, a nonlinear program where we'll construct our surrogate-based optimization. Here, I just take the norm of all of the constraint violations, stacked up into a vector. 
Now, we'll take this basic optimization problem I'm showing here, shown in the full space, for one minimizing one objective and uh, subject to one constraint. Uh, again, I'm showing only two, one constraint here, but it generalizes to multiple constraints. Using active subspaces, we'll build surrogate models in the active subspace G star with parameterization Y sub A or sub B, depending on the space that you're in. This, constri this construction allows us to model, uh, to minimize the surrogate model in the active subspace while constraining, uh, maintaining the constraint. We also have to add this consistency constraint that enforces the talk between the two active subspaces. This contribution lets us optimize in high dimension using surrogate models built in reduced dimensional subspaces. Because the surrogate model is built in active subspaces, it means that we have to treat any result that comes out of this as an approximation. Uh, generally, designs that are found through this approach need to be followed up with a gradient-based optimization in the full space to re refine the result. But as I'll show, the surrogate-based approach is able to identify a region of the design space that's close to the optimum so that pure gradient-based optimization evaluations are required. So now I'll show you the results that rely on this strategy. I'll, I'll look at two problems, the biparabolic airflow and the Langley business jet. This is the optimization problem for the biparabolic airflow. Minimize drag and constrain the equivalent area uh, using 20 design variables. The reason that lift doesn't appear in this problem is because in two dimensions, lift and equivalent area are tightly coupled. While 20 dimensions is still a small parameterization in terms of aerospace design, it's larger than we would be comfortable modeling Gaussian process regression surrogate model. I use the surrogate based optimization built in active subspaces to identify a candidate optimum. Running the design, sim the, the design suggested by this approach in simulation yielded this result. It found that we could reduce the drag, but it was not respecting the constraint. So I follow up this design with a gradient-based optimization in the full space. Uh, this step brought the shape to an optimal result in only 18 evaluations, respecting the constraints and maintaining some of the performance improvement that was in the drag. Typically, these problems have to be cut off by hand in gradient-based optimization because they tend to just keep going on and on. But in this case, the optimizer was actually able to declare convergence on its own, which ends up being rather unusual in my experience. The result, as expected from engineering intuition, flattens the upper part of the airfoil while maintaining the lower part of the airfoil to maintain the equivalent area. Flattening the upper part of the airfoil is how this design is able to reduce drag. I compare the, the approach to 12 gradient phase optimizations that start from random locations in the full space. I'm plotting the history here of the drag and equivalent area for each sample squashed up into the sample index. The initial design is the Pentagon, and the final design is the star. Uh, you'll see here across the, all of the samples, no improvement was found over the baseline design, indicated here by this dashed line, uh, even after 150 evaluations for each one of these samples. Throughout my experience, uh, constraining equivalent area ends up being a, a difficult problem in supersonics. Under this parameterization uh, with freeform deformation control points, uh, there ends up being a narrow valley al along which the feasibility is maintained, and it tends to confuse gradient-based optimizers. To round out this experiment, I document here a comparison of the flow and adjunct solutions needed to reach the respective results. In this case, uh, there's a small cost-benefit for using the surrogate-based optimization approach, and it was able to find an improved result while the gradient-based optimizer was not. But more importantly here was that it was able to find these results while providing physically insightful information, like these deformation modes, which you won't find in gradient-based optimization. In the last part of my talk, in the last example here, I'll show the optimization approach applied to the Langley business jet, a three-dimensional problem. In this optimization problem, I'll minimize drag and constrain lift in equivalent area, this time in a very large dimension, 100, 198. We could not have approached this problem with surrogate-based optimization without active subspaces. Using the active subspace formulation in only three directions for lift, three for equivalent area, and five for drag, I drew several samples of the surrogate base optimum, which provided several trial designs for the full space. This plot here shows the deformation of the business jet for the design that performed best after simulation. Compared to the baseline geometry, it has a thinner fuselage, which reduces the wave drag associated with the vehicle. The subtle trade is also being made in the twist of the wing and the camber of the wing. 
you can see that the blue regions here, which are indicating the Z displacement of the surface, show that the trailing, the leading edge of the wing has been drooped, while the yellow and green colors here show that the, the mid core of the wing has been maintained with relatively small movements. A large amount of design, a large amount of the design problem is actually being actuated here. Uh, as the deformation show, modes that I showed you earlier all have found that there are the three quantities of interest have modes that include twist and camber for varying degrees of importance. Shape plots like these shown here are easily generated for different configurations of the surrogate based optimization problem and they can be screened by the designer quite quickly. The CFD solution for this particular design looks like this. I'm showing here a base, the baseline design and the optimized design on the top of the vehicle and on the bottom of the vehicle. Uh, drag was reduced by 8%. The lift coefficient actually increased, which indicates that additional drag reduction is possible. The trends of the equivalent area shown here at, different, at, at two different azimuthal locations, 0 degrees and 60 degrees, show that the trends are being respected, but uh, still additional refinement is needed to be sure that the bloom constraints is being respected. The design should be refined using gradient-based optimization, as I've shown with the biparabolic example. This is a preliminary result, and it comes out of the edge, right on the edge of my work, but it demonstrates the procedure and application in three dimensions. Note that the result was accomplished with only 150 design evaluations to inform the active cell spaces and the surrogate model. Several more constraints could be employed here, including the pitching moment, thickness constraints for the fuselage, and thickness constraints for the wing. Each of these could have been modeled in their respective surrogate. With, with surrogate models in their respective active subspaces. So today, to wrap up, I've shown you all the work that I've done to contribute to efficient optimization of supersonic vehicles. I've developed a new methodology that can use noi noisy gradients to create accurate surrogate models, making them useful for aerospace design optimization. An important part of this contribution was introducing a new approach to manipulating, manipulating noise hyperparameters in Gaussian process regression. I've also discovered the presen presence of reduced dimensional active subspaces in aircraft design problems and distilled the analysis of these subspaces into practice. A major result of these are that the active subspaces are actually coherent across design problems, which further validates the usefulness of active subspaces in aerospace design. And finally, I constructed a new strategy for aerospace design optimization that uses surrogate models built in individual active subspaces to accelerate the, 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 the uh, discovery of global optimum. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, I've also contributed this work to open source. Much of the surrogate modeling techniques I've shown you, you here today are found in a Python package that I call BiPy. And I've also uh, had the great pleasure of being able to contribute a small amount of work to another Python package that holds many of the active subspace analysis uh, techniques. And that's called the Python Active Subspaces Utility Library, otherwise known as Paul. Uh, Paul. <laughs> Uh, going forward, there are several areas for future work. Uh, in particular, a, a full mathematical investigation of the inverse mappings for optimization is needed for these active subspaces. In the work, the approaches that I've shown you for inverse mapping were developed heuristically. Uh, and so uh, a full mathematical investigation would be useful here. Additionally, using the eigenvectors uh, to condition the covariance matrix of Gaussian process regression could be an exciting path to go. The full eigenvector and eigenvalue decomposition can be used to rotate and scale the covariance matrix of, of the GPR, which could allow regression to be applied in the full space, including gradients and enabling an adaptive refinement. Uh, additionally, uh, it'd be nice to look at these design problems with active subspaces using additional constraints. And uh, I would hope to see that this work is applied to active subspaces, uh, with active subspaces and surrogate models in a conceptual level and mission level analysis of vehicles. SWAB is uh, such a toolkit that we've been working on in our lab and one that I've been very, very gracious to be part of for the last two years. Uh, with any luck, some of the surrogate modeling techniques will appear in this, in this package. This is a list of the work that I've published in. And I'll now proceed into uh, concluding the talk and making a few acknowledgments. So I'd first like to acknowledge my committee Thank you very much, everybody, for coming today, especially Stefano Ehrman for coming all the way from computer science and being the, cha the chair here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to have a uh, diversity of perspectives to be part of this committee. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Kokendorfer, it's been my pleasure to work with you for the last uh, few year and a half. 
especially to, to build some hexacopters for fun. That was totally related to my research, but hey, we did it. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, Crow, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to have you on my committee, especially on the eve of your return to the, to the department. Uh, Paul Constantine, uh, it's been great. Two, two, or it's been three years almost, uh, where I just ran into you at this, this random event for ICME, and uh, we threw together some uh, some data and, and his active subspaces, and lo and behold, all these exciting things happened, and has precipitated all the work here today. Paul has been really great to work with. He's really supportive and really enthusiastic for everything uh, that I've been interested in, and it's been a great pleasure to work with him. Last but not least, and um, my fearless advisor, Juan Alonzo. Uh, gosh, Juan, I, when, I, when, I, when I showed up here five years ago, um, I don't know if you remember, but you thought that I was, that you were my faculty advisor. Um, so uh, I was like, well, I wanted you to be my faculty advisor, but I, I was currently Professor McCormick's because I had an interest in hypersonic vehicles at the time. Uh, so through you know the, the narrow path that is life, I've ended up in Juan's lab, and uh, I've been extremely fortunate to be part of it. The lab is so awesome that all the, the, the diverse set of people that contribute to it, and of course your, your support and uh, uh, freedom for uh, freedom that you allow me in pr to pursue all the diverse sets of experiences. That's one of the reasons I came here uh, to Stanford is to find these diverse sets of experiences, and I'm really fortunate to have been able to have done it. Thank you, one more time. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to acknowledge NASA Supersonics and Lockheed Martin for, for funding most of my, uh, my time here. Uh, Aerospace Design Lab, as I just mentioned, and the team of SU Squared, especially uh, Francisco Palacios for, for blazing the trail, and Tom Kahneman for answering uh, all my crazy questions. Uh, Francisco Palacios actually had a very uh, important contribution to, to a large part of my, uh, my, my, my graduate work, and I'm really grateful for all the hands-on and, and uh, time we had uh, working on with SU squared. Last but, but not least, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the team that I've worked with with Swap Code and Swap Club. Uh, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys are an awesome, awesome set of people, awesome team to work with, and it's been a great pleasure to be able to actuate our respective visions for the different projects. Um, I'll also point out, uh, this is my family. They send me their, their love and support all the way from the East Coast. Out of irony, I show uh, a snowy picture here when we were on a ski trip this last winter. Uh, my father, uh, Bill, my mother, Laura, uh, my brother, Derek, and my brother, Lewis. Both of them are taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, it happens. <laughs> and last but not least, my girlfriend, Tamaki, uh, who's been dancing through life with me for the last four years, and it's been a great, uh, a great journey with her. And I'm showing some pictures uh, of, of us together, and it, it, I, I could not have made it this far without, without your support. Uh, Thank you so much, Tamaki. So um, with that, I'll wrap up the talk and I'll gladly take any questions. We'll ask the committee to hold our questions for the closed session, but the floor is open for questions from the audience. Marcus. Marcus. Uh, how would you say, in your own words, this work? It's in, let's say, the reduced order modeling stuff that goes on in Farhat's lab. Yeah, uh, Farhat has, and his students have done a lot of really exciting work in reduced order modeling. They operate with uh, proper orthogonal decomposition down inside of the flow solver. And that's the thing I treat as a black box. So uh, that, that's basically how it relates, is I, I, I'm not willing to walk down into the equations of, uh, of, of flow and, and decompose those into, into various shape functions of the flow. I treat it as a black box that I don't want to touch, and, and I try to interrogate it only with inputs and a scalar output with gradients. That's a great question. I think I have a question, but I have to clarify my understanding first. On the optimization part, when you talk about the mapping from the full space to the uh, reduced space, I can't remember. Yeah, the active problem. space. Um, so I guess I understand that you're looking for some global minimum in the full space. But you say it's too high dimension, so I would go to this this lower dimensional subspace and you find a global minimum there. And then you map back. Yes. Now with the mapping back, since it can map to any number of points in the full space, are there any guarantees that you're actually mapping to the global minimum back in the full space? Short answer, no. <laughs> okay. 
But uh, to an approximation, and that, that's, that's the important point here, is that, uh, and why the, the center chunk of my, my work is so large, is that we find that to an approximation, you can model a lot of behavior in a reduced set of uh, linear combinations of the inputs. And the mapping back is, it, 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 you're right, there's a lot of points to pick. The reason I chose the, uh, the norm of the, the design variable, which is, is basically trying to minimize <coughs> the distance against the baseline result, uh, is that uh, the general idea is, is that we probably don't walk too far away from our baseline design when we're at this stage in the design process. The vehicle has been laid out. We're not trying to move the, the wing a whole half a fuselage up. Uh, we just want to make small changes. And so, uh, at least in my experience, heuristically, the, that, that norm on the design vector is, is useful for this kind of problem. Other questions? Trial? You were optimizing for noise reduction. Uh, your implications for the cost fuel for passenger noise? Yeah, so noise reduction is, is, is handled by the equivalent area constraint. Uh, the implications for, for fuel reduction is handled by trying to minimize drag from, from an aerodynamic standpoint. So uh, the, the basic idea is that if we can reduce drag by constraining lift, uh, we Extend the range that we could fly, or reduce the amount of fuel we need to fly for, for a given range. Uh, first of all, congratulations! Very exciting stuff. Um, you know, I'm from computer science, and over there we spend a lot of time talking about how we enable rapid iteration for designers, and this worked bold in that. So it's really cool to see. Um, I have two questions. Um, first of all, I I should also make sure I understand this correctly. But if I understood correctly, then you take the geometry and you simplify it by representing it as one of these grids with higher level control points. Yes. Um, is this something that, um, in computer graphics, we often use uh, that as the starting point, that people start by building these kind of higher level approximations, like Bezier curves that we define the surface with before we end up with a mesh? Mm -hmm. um, is that something that's also simple here, that designers um, don't have to construct these boxes by hand, or if they do, is this something that you think is simple to do, that if, if I start with some piece of geometry, is there any magic in choosing how you parameterize that space? Cool, so yeah, choosing the box is, is basically a convenient way of parameterizing the problem. There's a, a whole set of ways that we could parameterize this, uh, and if, if I had my way, I would have been parameterizing it with CAD, with engineering-like variables from the start. But uh, when it gets to this, to this level of analysis with simulation, it ends up being really hard to to couple all those those together. So, preform deformation uh, boxes are yeah a simple way. It could be generated automatically. However, I generate them by hand in this case. Um, and so so yeah, it's it, it's a it's a simple simplification of the parameterization. Okay, and then I guess my <coughs> second question is, and, and um, you know, excuse the like computer scientists in the room. <laughs> because maybe this is not surprising, but to me it was surprising is that some of the ge uh, geometry changes you showed look quite different than what a uh, non-expert in the field would expect to see from a uh, flying wing. <laughs> um, is this something that the result of this tool is like ready for manufacture, or do you imagine this is something that will then inspire a designer in the next iteration of building a high-fidelity model? The shapes that you get from the active subspace modes, uh, I would not call ready to go and cut metal. Uh, it would be more for, yeah, informing the designer as he's making iterations. Uh, there's so many other things that come into the process. And, uh, but, but even knowing how, like, whether I should look at the wing before I should look at the fuselage is, is becomes useful when, you, when you're getting started. Thanks. Any other questions? Mike? Uh, general question. Mm -hmm. uh, take you five more years to answer this fully, I'm sure. But uh, how would Kansas. you, how general is your method, and how would you change it if you talk in a second or a third black box following? the internal structure of that aircraft and I had to use a black box structural solving and stress expansion. So how general is method? I'll, I'll only answer this from the side of active subspaces and using it to decompose the dimensionality of inputs. Uh, we've seen active subspaces used across a whole set of problems at this point, much uh, thanks to the work that Paul's done to growing a community around it. Some of the, the kinds of problems that we found or that, that him and the community have found active subspaces work for are uh, solar cells and the models that go behind that. Uh, parts of uh, fluid um, uh, earth stimulation of, of wells inside of uh, down in the earth, and even within our lab, uh, a student Francisco Catherstein has been using 
uh, access subspaces to reduce dimensionality for rocket design and, and planning trajectories. So I'd say it's quite general in terms of looking for important linear combinations. Uh, obviously, a lot more work is needed to, to apply it towards the design. Any other questions? Tom, last question. Okay. Um, earlier on, when you were showing different like aerodynamic quantities as you increase the dimension of the access subspaces, you know, uh, so you're like different errors at the end. Yeah. Okay. There were errors. There, there were measures of error. Yeah. So I was wondering why you look at them and then you're getting near. You had 20, like a full basis would have been 20 uh, dimensions large, and I assume that you had ordered them by the size of the eigenvalue. So I was wondering why you would see fairly big upward spikes as you'd already added, you know, most of what I would have thought would be your significant. Like, so if you're adding another dimension that has a really small eigenvalue, why would you see a big jump up and then maybe add one more dimension that has an even smaller eigenvalue and you jump way back down to where you were before? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I wish I had more time to have talked about it during the talk. The, the purple line that you're thinking of and whether or not to go back to the slide. I can go back to this one. So 45 was one of them. Great. So you're, you're calling attention to like this one here, right? Where we see these, these jumps? Yeah, so you get out to like eigenvalue like 18 or whatever, and all of a sudden pop way up near her. Yeah, so an important component of this purple line, this is the, the, the heuristic measure of uncertainty for the surrogate model. Uh, an important component is the uh, error of the eigenbasis, the, the error of, that we think we have with which way the eigenvector points. And so what it's showing is as we increase our dimension, the error of the collective set of vectors actually goes up, which is kind of strange to think about. And it's taken me a while to kind of get my head around it. but. But the basic idea is that we only have a small set of samples in the end, 100, maybe 200. Uh, and as we do this resampling of the gradients to, to estimate the uncertainty, it turns out that as we kind of perturb our, our gradients, we actually get really different directions in the eigenvector. And so that's what this, these, these gaps or these jumps are, are capturing. And that means that we have to be careful if we, we want to choose a basis of that size. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so compared to the other, other values, you, th these are uh, testing and training errors on the actual surrogate, so they're much, much smoother. Mm -hmm. So just as a well, clarification then, so like the basis size for 15, <coughs> is that, and then when you move to 16, is that not the same original first 15 plus uh, like sort of the next eigenvalue down? Instead you're saying, I want a basis size of 16 now, and I'm gonna recompute the Yes, I, I, re I run everything over again. Each, okay. each one of these points is a, like, choose a basis, Build a surrogate model, evaluate its errors. Okay. Yeah, that's a rather big experiment. Well, we stop here and thank Trent. Uh <laughs> and this concludes the public portion of the exam, so we'll take a five minute break and then get started with a closed session. Thank you. <laughs>